fast forward in, in, into 2016, sort of third quarter of 2016, when actually trade starts to recover. And it's just not prices, it's actually much more than that. If you look at the, uh, the volume of exports of goods and services across the world, we've seen double-digit expansion in the real volume terms of goods and services throughout last year. It has been a bit of a laggard, but certainly East Asia is doing fabulously well. So I, I agree, I, I kind of, uh, you know, prices had a, very, uh, had a little bit to play, but it was much more the real economy which was driving it, and you see it now in kind of growth across the region. Now, looking forward, I'm actually quite uh, optimistic, and uh, because, you know, we're in a kind of uh, phase of synchronized expansion, and, and the financial markets are nervous, and rightly so, because there's been a very sharp uh, run-up in valuations and asset prices. So they're actually looking one year ahead. They're not looking at what the real economy is doing, and the real economies are improving. So they're looking at one year ahead, which is uh, what is, let's say, U.S. monetary policy, what does the Fed do? So, and, and uh, they're getting, because the, the financial markets have to readjust to... Uh, Fed, faster Fed policy normalization. So that is sort of the first cloud on the horizon. The second cloud on the horizon is China. Uh, China uh, uh, you know, uh, has at some point to deleverage. And we don't see that yet, but uh, you know, people are nervous about uh, the kind of the spillovers from China. Third is trade. And here, what the U.S. does in terms of trade policy vis-a-vis China, India, Korea is, is critical. And, you know, this is an election year which is coming up, and the Trump administration will be under pressure to be more proactive on, on trade policy. So we see uh, trade restrictions coming from, from the U.S. It's couched in terms of fair trade. And the last kind of uh, cloud on the horizon is geopolitical tensions. Middle East here, uh, Middle East, East Asia, and Europe. So these are the kind of four uh, clouds in the horizon, but uh, uh, which could dampen some of the global growth. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, we are in the beginning of an investment cycle, and I think we're in the beginning of a trade cycle, and uh, some of these trade finance flows are coming back, so I'm optimistic. That's nice to hear, wonderful to hear. Uh, let's all look forward to better days and brighter days. But uh, still, certain questions remain unanswered. Now, Daniel, if you really look at it, the estimates vary. WTO says about 20 to 30 percent or 10 to 20 percent of uh, trade finance flow is financed by banks, and uh, 80 percent comes through uh, inter-firm trade or inter-firm financing and all. Asian Development Bank, of course, on the other side, has to say that 50-50, something like 50% is internally financed, 50% is externally financed. Trade finance as a mechanism is essentially a self-liquidating credit. It has all the pluses on its side. It's a self-liquidating credit. You have the advantage of knowing what the receivables is and what, where the receivables are. You know the counterparties. You have dealt with the counterparties on the commercial plane. So all this should have actually led to a situation where even forgetting the bank credit, the inter-firm firm credit flow should have continued and trade finance should have continued. Astonishingly, somehow, somewhere, that link also got broken. And uh, uh, all through the period, at least from 2009, 10 onwards till 2015, 16, we definitely had a downtrend. Now, one part, the bankers, banking sector decline in finance could have been because of among others, the regulatory reasons. And the other thing, inter-firm comparisons, what it could be due. Now, I would like to like you to take up any of these, either the inter-firm or the banking sector. What could have actually led to a crisis, a shortage? Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just, just responding to that, and I just want to um, respond to one thing. Um, when we talk about Basel III um, and the implications, I think most get it from the wrong end. If you look at uh, credit risk weighted assets for the sophisticated international banks, that's not the issue. 
on a trade book, and I run one, 40% is now operational risk-weighted assets. So there is an additional um, element. And now um, just a bit more water into the wine. I'm not sure who has gone through the new regulations of IFRS 9. That's not um, supporting trade finance because mitigating instruments are now um, classified as a derivative and commercial banks need to book classical trade finance um, on a, a trading book with the full mark-to-market -market and focal rules rather than on, on a banking book. So I um, want to pause here. I think we need to be all over and, and, and everybody should do a bit of lobbying. Regulations are okay, but they shouldn't be too complex. So they should be simple and an average intelligent person should be able to understand it. What, what you mentioned earlier is that we do Basel III without modeling because otherwise we would have found out earlier that the regulations uh, would, would not be fit for purpose. So I think we need, we need every, we need a, you will build more trust in trade finance and more confidence and it's all about that by simplification of the underlying mechanisms including rules and regulations. Let me now come to a, a second topic where you said traditional banks or bank financing were the, uh, versus other forms of trade finance. What, what we see, and, and we alluded in, in that, that conversation to it, is there is ample liquidity, and ample liquidity also went into asset funds. Asset funds are now getting more and more careful in the way they invest, and we see a huge, I mean really a massive movement towards the asset class of trade finance. However, institutional investors, including family offices, do not understand the asset class trade finance because there's no index you can look up, there is no Bloomberg where you can just, just, just get, get the data. So we need commercial um, banks to help the transformation of these asset class and make it digestible for institutional investors. Coming to your, your, your other point of um, what is financed via traditional banks or intercompany, most of the intercompany financing for trade finance is on the back anyhow also financed by, by banks or commercial banks. It's just not a one-to-one -one, um, relationship of the trade finance, it's just by, by, by the other means. So I think we are not lacking the instruments, we are not um, lacking the, um, the, the capabilities, we just need to simplify it and make it more accessible um, for the bro uh, broader um, ecosystem. And it would be so easy and I would love to just point at one or two um, issues, but it's the combination of a lot of, of issues and we have not um, touched at all, and I'll leave that also aside, I just mentioned it also, that there is a new way of, 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 of dividing and conquering the world, and that is by having sanctioned policies against certain countries or halfway imposed sanctions, which then make it even um, more cumbersome to do um, um, open trade. Thank you. Professor Chandrasekhar, this uh Anyway, even open account trade stopped to a very, very significant extent during the period of crisis. Was it basically a reflection of global economic development, lack of confidence, or what was it? Well, I suppose if you, if you, uh, what, I mean, the way I would look at it is, uh, what is clear now is the perception that prevailed that the monetary lever is enough to pull economies out of the recession that they had gotten to after the financial crisis. That, uh, that really didn't work, I mean, that, which is why we got to a situation where there was this huge infusion of liquidity, plus we kept cutting interest rates, expecting that this at one point of time would actually spur the recovery, and, and, and it didn't. It, that's why we entered this terrain of negative real interest rates. And if you have negative real interest rates, you will have asset price bubbles, because I can borrow at near zero rates or negative, I mean, well, at near zero rates and then go and invest in markets even if I make 2%. That's, that's, that's a return that I get. 
so so this whole idea that you that you you actually are not worried about asset price inflation but so long as goods price inflation is not there you'll keep pump, pumping liquidity that didn't work and i th- i do think it's it's troubling that so early in the recession we are observing inflation what is troubling now the federal reserve what's troubling the federal reserve is much faster than they expected they are seeing a rise in wages from of course levels which were not too high they're seeing a rise in wages and inflation now if so early you start getting inflation then obviously ability to be able to continue with this so the way i look at it is you know we need to separate between trade finance undertaken by conventional financial institutions and those undertaken by specialized financial institutions and i think what we should be looking for at the current moment is the way in which we can strengthen an infrastructure which helps do two things it helps insulate or ensure trade participants from what is going to be extremely volatile exchange rate movements given the unraveling of asset asset markets and the second is really that if you happen to be in a world in which global value chains is determining the flow of trade there's always an asymmetric relationship between those who participate in trade in developing countries and fit themselves into this value chain and those who dominate the international marketplace so therefore they would be the ones who would actually get direct finance whatever open account whatever you want to call it and uh, therefore would not be in a position to be able to bargain between big players in order to get themselves a good deal so the way i think think of it is that we should be looking at one of course strengthening institutions which can ensure against uh, against exchange rate risk but second to create specialized institutions which give a certain degree of power to the elbow of particularly medium enterprises participating in world trade such that they can sit at a table and negotiate prices which are decent from the point of view of raising wages in emerging markets and therefore creating global demand to be able to overcome the difficulty of monetary policy to give you the exit from 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 recession that you actually need real recovery and you need to do that through medium and small enterprises what i'd say that is really something great challenging uh, no doubt basically it's a question of shifting terms of trade in favor of the medium and small scale industries and more in favor of the emerging markets uh, we hope all those things would happen we have been working